we're going to look at internationalization. Or this is also considered IATN, and that's due to the fact that there's 18 characters in between the I and N, and so we just often refer this to IATN. And the general idea of IATN is to extract any kind of static text within your views or your code and use that to where you can call something like IATN translate and then pass in a key and that key would then be referenced to get the value that would be displayed here. And because we are using active record, then we can also do something like our model and then pass human attribute name and then pass in a symbol of the attribute. So it would look something like this, where we have first name, which is our static text, and then we have this translate missing, en.last underscore name, and then we have email. So because we use the full i18n.translate, it's actually going to show us that we have the missing translation. And to get around something like this, we can just use the shorthand for translate, which is t. Going back and refreshing, you'll see now it just capitalizes each first letter and replaces the underscore, with a space. So today we're going to look at how we can set this up within our Rails application and just some of the nuances and different things that you need to know about IATN in order to successfully translate your application into another language. One of the best references that you can use for IATN is the official Rails guide. There's a lot of great information including how to set this up for your application and the different available APIs that you're able to use. So you have translate and localize, i18n.t or i18n.l and then they have a lot of different things that you can do to set this up in your application. So first under the config application.rb file you want to set the available locales and you can just pass an array and then a symbol for each one of the locales that you want to use. Then you can also set a default locale and we're going to just set this to English. And then within the config routes.rb file, we can wrap our routes within a scope. And here we're just going to pass in parentheses, meaning that we're not going to require the locale, which is okay because we have a default locale set in our application.rb file. We then pass in a locale option here. And then in this format where you have the two forward slashes, you then pass in each one of the locales that you want to support followed by a pipe to separate them. And just so we don't have to maintain our list of locales in two places, we can replace this with the list from i18n.availablelocales, and then we can just join this with the pipe. And then in our application controller, we can set a before action filter for the set locale. And then we can create our private method set locale, and then we set our i18n locale equal to the parameter locale, or we set it to the i18n default locale. And this private method would also be a good place to set up a different way to get the user's locale. For example, if you have a current user, they might add a locale attribute to that user model. You can also get the request.environment HTTP exec language. And in order to get the routes working correctly, we do need to use the default URL options and then tell that the locale is the IATN locale. And then we just merge in the options that are passed in. And this is just for the URL generators. So for each locale that we have, we do need to create a locale file. And the locales by default are stored under the config locales directory. So we'll have a different locale for each one of the different languages that we have. So for example, our english.yaml file, we have a few different items that we'll go over in a second. And then our Japanese one, we have a few different options in here as well. So in our navigation header, we have something like this where we have a link to switch to English. Then for the route, we just pass in the locale English parameter. And same for switch to Japanese, we just pass in the locale JA parameter. And we're only going to display these links unless if the current page is already set to the locale Japanese, or we're only going to display the English unless if the current page is selected to the English language. And as an example, in our visitors index.html file, we first have our h1 tag, and you'll see that we just have a t greetings. And this will reference into our English file to the greetings tag, and we should see a hello guest. In the Japanese file, we'll see some Japanese text, and this would be displayed if we had the Japanese language selected. Next, in our first h4 tag, we have a default and then we're passing in the localization for the date, and this is just going to show the date.today, 
in a format that we have specified in our YAML file. And then we have a short date. And here we again pass in the L and then date today. But we also pass in a optional parameter format short. So in our English file, if we look under the date formats, we have a default where we show the month, day, and then year. And for the short format, we just have the month slash day. And in the Japanese file, we have the year followed by the month and then day. And then for the short, we can just pass in the day slash the month. So if we look at our index page, we see our hello guest with the exclamation mark that we saw in our English YAML file. And then we see our date, the full month, the day, and followed by the year. And our shorthand just shows the month and day. If we click the switch to Japanese, you'll see that it'll take us from the EN to the JA, and immediately you see the translation text. And then here we have our year, month, and then day. And then here we have our year and day. So if we save our Japanese text, so now the date short format should show the day and month. So you can see here after we refresh, now it shows the day and then the month. And this is just to illustrate that once you create your YAML file, you will need to restart your Rails application. However, any changes since then, you won't have to necessarily restart the Rails application, but it may require a browser refresh. And then in our user's index action, we have something like this in our H1 tag, where we have translate users, and then we pass the scope models. And the scope models is going to be a nesting hierarchy within our YAML file. So on the right hand side here, you can see where we have this models key, and then nested under it, we have users, and then users exclamation mark. This could also be written as if we take out the scope models, if we get rid of our symbols, we can call model.users to get the same effect. And then for the header row for our table, we're using the model human attribute name, and then we pass in the symbol of the attribute that we're wanting to display here. And the reason why we do this in our header is because we're going to be able to use this by default elsewhere within our application when we actually go to our user form. And this model helper method, that references to our active record, attributes, user, and then we have our attributes, first name, last name, and then email. So typically when I'm messing around with the locales, I'll do something like this where I go into the YAML file and I'll just put in some kind of special character that'll let me know that this field has been translated. So now if I click on switch to English, because that's where we made our changes in the locale, you'll see that we have our first at name, last at name, and then email at. So we know that our headers are working with the locales. So let's go ahead and edit this first user. You'll see that it automatically updated the labels as well. So now we don't even have to go into our form to make any kind of changes because of our hierarchy within the YAML file, it automatically picked these up. So back in our visitors index, let's create a duplicate of this line, and then let's pass in a dot greetings, and then we'll wrap this in a quote. And this is gonna be for a page specific. So if we don't have this translation greetings in other places in our application, then it might be good to namespace it using the dot. So now we want to see what kind of health we have on our i18n translations. So we can do a gem install i18n tasks. And this will give us access to the i18n tasks command. So if we type i18n tasks, we can run dash dash help and we can get a list of the different options available. So the main ones that you'll probably want to use is health. And this is just going to show us how our overall health is for the missing and unused translations. And then if you have an API key to Google Translate, then you are able to translate missing. However, I wouldn't really rely on Google Translate to translate my translations. And then you can use add missing to add keys into the different locale files that are missing translations. And then you can also use unuse. And you want to be careful with the remove unuse and the unuse because they can generate false positives. So I'm going to run i18n tasks and then run health just to see my overall health of my translations. So here you'll see that I'm missing now the visitors index greetings because I added in that second h1 tag. You'll see that I'm also missing the last name and this is generated under the user show page. And then under the navigations link, I'm also missing the users key. And then have a look at the unused keys down here. And this is where my real concern with this gem is. And this is why I don't use the unused too much. 
because we have a lot of these active record attributes user that are being flagged as unused. However, what IETNN test doesn't realize is that I'm actually using these translations, we're just not specifically calling them out. And then the same thing for our date formats. Rails automatically picks up this hierarchy within our YAML files and it automatically knows how to use them. However, they still get flagged as unused because we're not explicitly calling them within our application. So let's go ahead and fix all of our missing locales. I'll enter the visitors, it was in the index page, and then it was a greetings key that was missing. And now we have a nice nesting to show us the path in which this key is actually used. So the second place where we had an issue with the missing translation is where we had just explicitly called the translate last name. Instead, we want to use on our show page, whenever we have a actual attribute that we're referencing, we want to use a human attribute name. So if we call last name and then we translate the first name, then we have something like this. And with the link to's, with the edit and back, because I know this is going to be used throughout the application, I might just call a translation tag and then just call this edit. And then I'll just put a top edit and a top back within my translation files. So in my translation file, I'll put the edit and then I'll also create a back one. And then within our navigation links, we had our last tag that was unused. And you see that we're referencing our users here. Instead, we can call our model, and then we can call model name, and then we can just pass human onto here. And what this will do is, within our YAML file, under the active record, it's actually going to look for the model, and then the users. So now under our active record, we have model and attributes, we have our user, and we call this users. And then under the attributes, we have the different attributes for a single user. And then in our users index page, we can get rid of our scope nested hash like here, and then also reference a user model name human. So now if we call the ITN task health again, we can then see what we have returned back. So we're missing a lot of translations in our Japanese file. And then we still have the unused formats, which I'm not really too worried about these. So we can now call i18n tests, then add dash missing. And this will automatically add the missing locales and you'll see which ones were added. So in our Japanese file, we added in all the necessary locales that we needed. So if we look at the Japanese locale file, you'll see that it did just copy this from a existing one that it did find the translations for. However, if we were to compare this file as well as the English file, you'll notice that there's a lot of discrepancies as far as how the two are laid out, and that can be very confusing if you're trying to translate them. So I'm going to just clean this up a bit, where at the top, we're just going to put in the similar format that we have in the Japanese locale file, but you'll see that everything is out of order. So back in our console, if we call i18n task and then normalize, then this is going to go through the locales and basically put them in alphabetical order. So now if we look at our locales file, you'll see that they're all the same and the line numbers referenced to each file are referencing the same tag. And this is gonna make it a much easier for a translator to kind of compare which attributes are on each file. Well, that's all for this episode. Thank you for watching. For more videos, check out driftandruby.com.